Hello. There are those of you who remember Russian Sock Puppet. Ha, huh, yes. And again, this is Drama Local. <coughs> <laughs> I'm be <coughs> being assaulted! And I'm Stephen Jeffries. And I'm a creepy little sock puppet! Indeed. Today what? we are talking about uh, conflict out of Diggory's The Art of Dramatic Writing. Um, let's say we jump into jumping. Yeah. No. Well, actually, he has a point. It does have a lot to do with conflict. Are you taking his side, Doug? Ha! I can see you. You're part of my arm. <clears throat> anyway. Jumping conflict. Conflict that moves way too fast and has no discernible reason for moving as quick as it does. Things like, I hate your mother! Things like that. Why, why do you hate my mother? She's, she's a nice lady. I'm disappointed in you. I don't even know his name. He's kind of a jerk. He's got teeth. It's creepy. In Jumping, uh, Egri does talk about, uh, if you know your character has to travel from one pole to another, you are in an advantageous position to see that he or she grows at a steady rate. Um, so again, we, we are reminded that we should know our characters quite thoroughly. Better than we know ourselves Bingo. in some instance. It's weird because when you're building a fictional character, you have to know every aspect of their being. You know, you have to think them through, probably think about it more than you think about some of the things that we do from day to day, you know, just like in real life. Right. Um, so what struck you in particular about what you had to say about jumping conflict, Doug? Well, later um, he uh, brings up that real characters must be given a chance to reveal themselves, and we must be given a chance to observe the significant changes which which take place in them. Um, so it there's this organicness that has to be retained in the characters. We have to see them as real. We cannot see them as constructs. We can't allow things that are too constructed to happen to them, or else we'll be able to see those constructs and just see how constructed uh, the play is. It's like when you're at a play and it's clear that nobody's enjoying themselves. And I, uh, fair princess, um, uh, kiss me, uh, for not tonight, for sooth. You know, it's painfully obvious that they don't want to be there. And it feels so wooden that it's just, you know, painful for everyone else. If, if two characters hate each other, if two characters want to kill each other, we should, we should see that development. We should see that hatred. You know, it, it shouldn't just kind of, you know, come out of nowhere. What is that? That's a coffin. For you. When you die. <laughs> like that. That didn't make any sense at all. I... I it's on my arm, and that didn't even make any sense. Jumping conflict. There's no reason that the gross little sock puppet should hate Douglas. He's done nothing to offend the sock puppet. Not that I'm aware of. Douglas, did you say naughty things about its mother? No, it's not. Um, I could have just said no and made this a lot less awkward for everyone. So. <laughs> Point two. Yeah. Point two. Let's jump rising. out of jumping. Yes, indeed. And into rising. Let's rise into rising. I need to kill these puns. On uh, 172, uh, Agri brings up that 
classic bad play, Idiot's Delight. <laughs> I still want to um, go see that now. Me too. Um, and Google he talks it. about how do it. You know, only a few pages at the very beginning of the play, three full round characters before us talking about um, the example he gives on the page before from I believe Hedda Gabler. Um, but then he goes on to say, "We know them. They breathe and live. Whereas in Idiot's Delight." The author needs two and a half acts to bring his two main characters together to defy a hostile world in the closing scene of the play. That just seems like bad pacing. Think of this past summer's hit film, Dark Knight Rises. Ha ha! Dark Knight Rising. Was see what you did there. Remember. Anyway, um, if you haven't seen it, uh, there's a part where something really, really bad happens to Batman, a.k.a. Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Christian Wait, Batman's Bruce Wayne. Spoiler alert. <sighs> uh, but anyway, um, something so really, really sense. bad happens, and he's sent far, far away from Gotham, uh, which is apparently the center of the universe um, in those movies. And uh, so he has to gradually work his way back to uh, Gotham. Um, the center of the universe. Bingo. That's a long trip. But it's not too gradual. I mean, if it's too gradual, you're not going to see the resolution of conflict by the end of the movie. And those movies are long enough as it is. Yeah. Um, but we're even told later um, on 175, the drama is not the image of life, but the essence we must condense. In life, people quarrel year in, year out, without once deciding to remove the factor which causes the trouble. In drama, this must be condensed to the essentials, giving the illusion that years of bickering, of years of bickering, without the superfluous dialogue. It's like in an anime, when, say, two characters are facing off, and the one guy draws his sword and says, Aha! You are Hiro Miyamoto from the clan that killed my father 16 years ago when we were just a, little, a tiny little boy. And the other guy goes, Oh man! And you are Shiro Bakaduka, the dude that did all that but in reverse and then kicked my dog and burned down my house. And they try to cram all of this exposition into like 20 seconds of dialogue and it comes off as so cheesy and trite and obviously expository when, you know... In reality, the way to do that well, I'm not sure if any of those lines are salvageable from some of those shows, but in a play, to do that well, you want to give the audience the idea that that argument has already taken place, rather than trying to squish it all into 30 seconds of dialogue. You don't want to that see the never two and a half well. years, but you want to see that there is two and a half years. Yeah. Yeah, you want to see the conflict, but not have to hear all about it. it. It should be there in the subtext. It should be there in the way that they interact. That's why the, you know, Agri makes such a big point about saying that the author, you, need to know your characters. Because if they've been fighting for three years, their interactions are going to be different than if they've, you know, just met and they're sweethearts and this is their first little date and they're having their first big argument. I mean, there's going to be a marked difference in the way that those characters interact. So, y you know, it, it, it's not excusable just to throw crap in there like that. So, And then later, um, Agri talks about how conflict comes in waves, higher, rising higher and higher to an awesome crescendo, overwhelming in its power, until we start to scrutinize the characters. Um, which I thought was... An interesting sort of interruption to that until we start to scrutinize the characters. Until we start to uh, doing waves still. I'm done. You left me hanging. It's cool. Keep going. Uh, anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think of the. I think that's a really interesting distinction um, that he makes. Because honestly, I wouldn't have ever thought of it in terms of waves before, but it's, it's a really nice analogy. It's a really nice visual image. The conflict should begin small, but as it grows closer to shore, it should rise in force and size until it crashes against the sand and, you know, with explosive might, 
washes over everyone watching, only to follow up immediately with yet another little bubble of tension that is building and rising and ready to explode. Um, and again, with the explosions, I mean, I already like explosions, but Egri uses that to move on to chapter three as a really nice uh, analogy. He compares the movement in conflict, which is in fact the name of that section, to a series of tiny explosions that hurdle your plot, your characters and your conflict along. Um, you know, the jumping conflict, I guess, could be compared to that nuclear blast that the subtitle computer accidentally set off last time in its incompetence. But a good play doesn't go for two and a half acts with nothing and then suddenly explode. There's a lot more to it than that. So, I mean, movement, I'm, I'm not sure what you got out of it. A lot of it boils down to cause and effect, things that we've already talked about. But I know you had something well, kinda, interesting. Kind of going with that. Um, the way Egri kind of divides every basic conflict into um, attack and counterattack, where there mm -hmm. is this, this give and take. Um, there has to be this sort of mutual playing between the two sides of the conflict. Um, because, I mean, when you think about it, like, you know, you think of that chump on the beach, I believe that we were given a example of it here before um that goes in on the beach and then you know big beefy surfer dude comes up and beats him up for whatever reason um probably for being smarter than he was yeah but i mean there, there's no there's really no counter attack to that from the, the shrimpy guy if he's just kind of like laying there um you know covered in sand or whatever um you know his pain Compared to, you know, big dude. I wish muscle-bound jocks actually walked around like that. It'd be easier to point them out. Like, there's that guy. Be great. Like, you like know. that guy. That guy can go to hell. Imagine them in, like, the line in the movie theater. I'm like, one ticket for Dark Knight! I imagine they wouldn't get as much oh, good attention. i actually in the movie with them, though. Like, Lawrence Bane! Bane no good. Doesn't even like that. No good. No, Bane had that weird accent, that weird, like, I'm speaking through a fishbowl kind of voice. That's Tom Hardy, though, so it makes everything better. When Gotham, blah, 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 you have my permission to speak properly. <laughs> it was really weird. Not what I expected. But that's off topic. Um, I mean, movement's kind of a short chapter. Was there anything else you... No, really, you kind of, you already hit it on the noggin there. Uh, I like the explosions analogy because I like explosions. Um, other than that, you seem to cover pretty well. Good. So, I mean, unless you have a question for Ralph, the dead raccoon, you can ask him anything, Doug. What the hell do you I'll have? I'll answer honestly. I don't want to ask him that. I want to ask you that. What the hell do you have? 